LRTs that are working were all installed 20, 30, 40 years ago. The, so by the time this one gets installed, and it's going to be as old as your, as a, as your Commodore computer. Um, can, can you imagine going back and saying, I want to spend $2.4 billion to upgrade my computer technology to 1960s standards? He would get laughed at the, at the park for suggesting that. Hello, One Sunny Day Podcast. Today my guest is Jim Young, longtime transit advocate, and today we will be speaking about the uh, future of transit. Hello, Jim, and welcome to the program. Thank you, Greg, and hello. And uh, so we'll start off, uh, what, what brought upon this, uh, uh, this program today was that the sort of feds announced that they had come up with uh, $4.2 billion dollars for uh, to rebirth the Hamilton LRT project. And since that money was available, there's now pressure for Hamilton to say what they're doing. And you had some uh, thoughts of the matter that you uh, had made into an op-ed. And I just wanted to uh, go over that with you. So what's, what's your thoughts on the matter, Jim? Obviously, as a transit and, um, advocate, I find myself kind of torn. When anybody offers billions of dollars for any form of transit, it's very tempting to say, that's great, just take the money and run. Um, my problem is that, the, and I, again, I'm not sure whose numbers are correct, I have 3.4 billion. You had said 4 point something billion. Oh, it could be 3.4. I, I read one 4.2 article, but the the confusion is is that there's there, there's like a bunch of stuff in the sandwich, right? There's like, it's like a whole sandwich of transit spending. And then I think if you take, the I, I think 3.2 isn't 3.2 come from where, what Hamilton said it would cost to complete. It's 3.4 and it's 1.7 from the federal government and 1.7 from the provincial government. Initially, if you remember, the the estimate was 1.1 billion that the province was going to give, and then what just about a year ago, Doug Ford said we're not going to give that any longer because it's going to cost about 5.4 million and that 1.1 billion was grossly underestimated. So th that's one of the problems I have is that Doug Ford cancelled it last year because he thought it would cost 5.4 billion, I think it was. And now he's saying, hey, you can do it for 3.4 billion. <laughs> so um, the, the inconsistency worries me. But what worries me more is that 3.4 billion is a big white of money. Um, you could do a whole lot of things for transit with $3.4 billion. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to improve one transit line in one city with $3.4 billion. Um, when I look at all the other things that are wrong with transit across the province, and particularly in the bigger cities, um, most transit people could find lots and lots of better ways to utilise $3.4 billion. To to me, it seems like a sort of political gambit. There's elections coming up for the province, certainly next year, possibly later this year for the feds. So everybody's trying to get something big and shiny on their agenda. Um, so yeah, a, a big transit project uh, looks good on paper, but I'm not sure that it actually does anything for the general well-being of transit. When you take that Hamilton B line. If they, if they spend about 10 years um, bringing LRT to it, and supposing you increase the ridership on that line even by 10 or 15 percent, what have you done? You, you, you sort of moved up one transit line in the whole province. Well, and you have to give them credit for like they because when they do the transit, right, they'll always say, well, in the future, this is how many people will be living here by the time the transit's done. Because as you noted, it's a, it's a 10 year long project. But when you Take it, uh, let's take, when I take the GO train, for example, right? If you use 2019, the the uh, the GO train got, uh, just compare it to different systems, right? And so for people who are listening from from uh, um, uh, from all over North America, I've got to give them a little bit of scale what we're talking about here. So we have Toronto, and then Toronto's sort of in the center of core. It is a subway supporting it, right? And then uh, the, the, uh, the subway in the Toronto core only goes so far. As an extension of that, they have the GO train system. And the GO train system runs like a spider 
west, east, uh, uh, you know, and north. To the south, there's a lake, so there's obviously no need for transit there. Then, you know, Lake Ontario uh, uh, curves off at the end, and if you get right to the end and you started going around the corner of Lake Ontario, you find Hamilton all the way at the west, right? Yeah. And there's um, uh, when you so when you get out to the when you get out to that western, you have sort of a a smaller, a much smaller city, right? And mm -hmm. then, so the, so this always becomes the, uh, um, the debate always becomes, well, if you built this thing, right, for $4.2 billion, because I don't think by any calculation you can make it make sense right now. Is that, is that fair? A $4.2 billion system for 600,000 people? It's like $7,000 a person, right, or something like that. Not only does it not make sense now, um, I don't think it makes sense for the future. Um, if you look at what LRT systems are, right, the, the, the road railways, right? It's a system of rail guided transit that was invented 200 years ago. Um, it's the, the, the LRT part of the technology was being developed in Germany in the 1960s. That's 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. LRTs that are working were all installed 20, 30, 40 years ago. The, so by the time this one gets installed, and it's going to be as old as your, as a, as your Commodore computer. Um, can, can you imagine going back and saying, I want to spend $2.4 billion to upgrade my computer technology to 1960s standards? You would get laughed at the, at the park for suggesting that. But here, this is what we're going to do. We're going to spend, I said, I think it's 3.4 billion. It'll be more than that, by the way, because that's just what the governments have given us. Hamilton still has to come up with a lot of money too. Um, yeah, but again, as, as I say, uh, they're going to invest all that money in a technology that's already 60 years old, and by the time it's finished, will be nearly 70 years old. And at a time when transit and transportation technology is moving forward so fast, Burlington and Hamilton are already looking at um, Uber-type services for the transit, where you dial for, for service, and they're installing programs that let people call up a bus from their cell phone. Ten years from now, that will be ubiquitous. And here we are, ten years from now, we'll be finishing a, a very inflexible system. So I think the, the future of trans the future of transportation is going to be very flexible, very very demand driven, very consumer driven driven. Um, fixed rail does not it's not able to adapt. Once it's in, it's in. And when it proves to be a bad idea, it's it's very tough to remove it. Hamilton spent years to take no railway tracks. I mean Hamilton's transit system is called still called Hamilton Street Rail because originally it was a tramcar service. Yeah, I think at one point Hamilton had the highest uh, density of streetcar tracks per like people anywhere. It was it was it was sort of almost it was almost sort of like considered the paradise of streetcar. So, but I I think what you make an interesting point about the inflexible, but I have had conversations with people and they sort of state the inflexibility of the system is a positive Right. So they'll say so someone will say, well, if you if you figure out how many people are going to move per time in this thing. Right. Uh, an extra lane on the, the you know, an extra lane of, of pavement that you turn into a dedicated, you know what I mean? A bus only lane is way cheaper than anything. It, it like it blows away any chart. It's it's yep. almost free by comparison. But they'll say, no. Well, the problem with that is the minute you make this lane. Right. There'll be political pressure, you know, brought to bear to remove it or, or, or you know, allow cars on it, et cetera, et cetera. And it'll disintegrate. And the advantage in those people's minds is that the LRT is kind of like here and we're stuck with it. And then if you build a building or you build a commercial enterprise, you can kind of bet that this LRT will be here, even if the LRT is infinitely subsidized, you know, in such a way yeah. that that. It doesn't make any sense. It can go on not making sense for decades and decades and decades. And you've been to your fair share of transit meetings, as have I. And in every one of the transit meetings, once the plan is not working, somebody always puts their hand up and says, well, the reason why it's nurking is because the system isn't cheap enough. It doesn't go far. You know what I mean? Is, mm -hmm. it, is, that, is that a fair uh, a point? 
Again, again, you're right. Um, demographics are con constantly changing. When, when I came to Canada 40 years ago, there was almost nothing up on the mountain, especially on the, the east end of the mountain. Um, now it's a huge population area, um, but it's not serviced by transit. Um, so that if you build in flexible systems and demographic change, then you're left to them. Um, I, I don't think that it being fixed is a positive. Um, I, I think it's an absolute negative and a long-term detriment to, to, to transportation in the city. Well, I think it kind of solves the wrong problem too, right? Because the, the problem that, that people are after is they're trying to go from their house to some other place, right? That's really what they're trying to do. And the reality is they're trying to do it quickly, right? Like they're, they're getting up in the morning, they're trying to go to work, they're trying to get home. So as as much as as much as we might want to romanticize a nice ten minute walk down to the LRT and then a ten minute walk on the end, right? That person that that day might want to spend that twenty minutes doing something different, right? So when you go to these more flexible models, see, I think it's I I think that it's a no brainer that um, that if you wanted to subsidize transit for a certain group of people. And you and, and, and a couple other municipalities that they've done this, they've taken their transit budget and they've said, OK, so if you're going to use Uber or one of the other e-car services and you start in the city and you end in the city, like the trip is just inner city. Right. We'll go and we'll put five bucks in the kitty for each one of those trips. And what that does is that lowers the the price. And, and I think Metrolinx was saying they were going to do it to the go train station. Right. And so that that lowers uh, the barrier of entry for you taking this trip you know, down by some number of dollars. And then that makes it just sort of more accessible because uh, the bus fare is not cheap either, right? Like, like it's hardly a cheap system. So the, the, the basic point is you're about to launch into something which is going to take 10 years to plan out. You can't change in the middle of the 10 years. And there's a bunch of really bizarre stuff in there, even in the current plan. I was having a conversation with... Um, uh, a guy who actually sold these transit systems that just happened to be uh, the parent of uh, one of the kids that went to daycare with my kids. And um, he was uh, uh, saying that uh, of all the systems he was selling, I'm like, how many of these systems are, are being being built you know, or, or in, in around the world that still use human drivers? And he's like, none. He's like, there's no human drivers in any of them except this this HRT system. And again, that's another thing when I talk about the, you know, the, the technology of battery buses and electric buses, um, driverless buses are the next thing. So, and again, program buses with programmable routes. When you get to the driverless bus, you can program the route. You can change your route every hour. You know, from during peak time, you run along King Street in Hamilton. Off peak time, you run partly along King Street, down onto Cannon Street, and along Tissot, where the volume is, where the demand is. You don't get to do that with an LRT. You may be able to make an LRT driverless. That's possible. In fact, that's probably fairly simple on an LRT. But you don't get any flexibility. If, if the midday demand is all on Cannon Street, then your LRT is going to be running empty along King Street and Main Street. Well, it's gonna. It's. <clears throat> I think it's part of the problematic idea is that it's the it's the old sort of idea of we're going to have this spine down the city. We're going to build everything around the spine. People will be to be able to to shift back and forth in the spine. But it, but I mean, we seem to be pretty close within a ten or twenty year period of talking about driverless cars, right? And, and again, I have a problem with a driverless car. Why bother? If you're going to send your car to get the groceries, you may as well be sitting in it. You still got a car on the road. <laughs> Um, driverless cars might be handy. Driverless transportation trucks and driverless trains and transit buses are probably a good idea. But the driverless car, it still puts a car on the road. The only difference is you're not in it any longer. Well, you're right in terms of in terms of total number of cars running around on the road system and the the total capacity of that absolutely it still puts a car on the road. But what it does allow you to do is it allows you to start going. It drives down the, the cost of on-demand transit service, right? So you can start saying, oh, well, if there's no driver involved in the car now, right? There's no reason I can't, dis there's no reason I can't have a, 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 a fleet of 20, 30, 40, 100, whatever it is, 
Burlington Robo Taxis, Hamilton Robo Robo Taxis, right? And that they can solve the point to point problem because the person at the end of the day, their problem is point to point, right? It's not it's not that they're visiting the transit system for the purpose of visiting the transit system, right? And then I've always thought the problem with it is that you then end up with two uh, stratas of people. One strata of per, one strata of pe- a person is going uh, uh, place to place really rapidly as fast as they want, right? Person two is spending 10, 15, 30 minutes, who knows, on the bus, right? They And when you start taking their hourly wage and multiplying it by every day times whatever times whatever, right? It's it's not a level playing field. The person who's using the bus, you know, is is, is trading those hours on transit for wages or, or something else. You see what I'm saying? Or the, so the thing is the on-demand fixes that problem because now they're going on demand, you're going on demand. We might be subsidizing it through through government services in some way, right? But but that, you know, I can you can have vans that come pick someone up and then maybe they make a couple stop and put four people in a car. It doesn't have to be a bus, right? You can there's lots of like uh small intermediate things you can imagine robo taxiing, right? I mean, they have this now through group, group Uber. So in the States, or not in the States, but in Toronto, well, they have in the States too, but in Toronto, you can sign up for a group Uber. And all the group Uber means is that like, you know, the, the, the Uber van, which like they, I think they're like using these like uh, uh, 10, p- 10 person big, you know, uh, airport shuttles will come pick you up, kind of picking other people up, make a 10, 20, 30 minute journey, and then sort of drop all the people off. And they have such a, they have such a saturation of people using that service that um, that that you can, you can, it's you can get with this with the sort of like intermediate vehicles you know two three four people riding in a car and as I'm sure you uh, you know know from your work on transit the problem is always almost everybody is in a car by themselves right so you can do a lot of work if you can get two or three people in a car I I think you can I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that it's the it's a complete uh, uh, traffic disaster you know what i mean no the, the one big advantage of it that, that people do foresee is that if you have driverless cars linked together in some kind of uber system on demand system you can probably do away with parking lots because everybody who drives to the mall needs a place to leave their car if you have driverless cars on demand where you call it up and say hey i'm jim young i want to go to burlington mall it comes, picks you up, drops you at Burlington Mall. It doesn't need to wait. It goes and does something else. So there may be the possibility to reduce parking areas. Yeah, I, I, I mean the 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 problem that I have is that the um, is that you know, to me, you 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 get into this percentage problem, right? Where you go right now and you're like ninety eight percent ninety eight percent of people are coming by car, and they expect to come there, park when they want, uh, go to the mall. And and get out. And I remember I was listening to this one thing uh, when the the still now director of uh, transit for Burlington was saying, you know, do we need to size the parking lot for Christmas? Right. Because really, the parking is only super saturated for a couple weeks of Christmas. And he's right. But what I said is, well, do you want there to be stores in the mall? <laughs> like like it's the, the person in the mall running their shop can't help that everybody wants to buy things in this weird two week period of Christmas. And if they're not open and they're not accessible they're out of business, right? So my my always concern with the with the uh, hey we're doing away with parking is I'm fully fully willing to do away with parking if you're sitting out there you know if you could, if you're sitting out there at Christmas and like nobody's in these nobody's in these parking spots nobody's in these parking spots that I'm like okay we don't need these par- this parking right and if you notice the commercial enterprises when they sense they don't need the parking. All of a sudden, they build like a little uh, pad site in the corner of their parking lot, right? I've seen we've seen that a bunch of places. The, the parking just wasn't needed, and then all of a sudden, the plaza gets like a little restaurant or two or three things in the far end. So they sense this by themselves. But I'm always very dubious when the city announces, "Oh, we don't need this parking anymore because of a future that may or may not arise," right? And creates this construction where we're going to have a lot more people, which are going to bring in a lot more cars, right? But we'll need we'll, we'll need less parking. But you're, but like you're right, you could have a whole sea change where, you know, people just don't even want the don't even want the trouble of parking, right? They're just like I'll just go up to the front door and then you know, 
my car will my car will go do whatever. So that that's possible, but I'm a little skeptical. I don't know if you saw the city of Burlington came out with their uh, strategic plan, and it had fifteen uh, percent of people in active transit, fifteen percent of people on uh, um, public transit, and then the rest. Uh, uh, made cars and that's up from basically zero and maybe one percent and I was like it, to me this just seemed like free form wishful thinking and not a serious plan you know what I mean I tend to be a, a bit dubious about city plans I think they come into it with a certain desire to make transportation healthier fitter greener and the, the, their plans are aimed at that sometimes more than they are about moving people around the city. Um, you know, and so they almost sort of gerrymander their, their survey results to come up with the, this idea that everybody will get on bikes and be walking within the next 20 years. I'm with you. I don't think it's happening, Greg. Uh, we know one number that came up in some of the discussions about the integrated mobility plan, I think they call it, is that 77% of the journeys made in Burlington could be made by walking or cycling. Not will be, could be. Uh, if 77% of the journeys in Burlington could be made by cycling or walking and people really wanted to walk or cycle, the 77% would already be being done. You wouldn't need a plan to get there. <laughs> um, so that when they talk about that 77% of journeys, um, I think it's a, a number something that like 77% of journeys are within 2.5 kilometres. Um, people are still going to get in their car and go to that for that 2.5 kilometres. You know, they, they may occasionally take a two and a half kilometre walk for their health or for fun or for entertainment. But I, I, I don't see people generally in North America saying, I'm going to go and walk to the grocery store. Well, it's this the is walk my, back that's Well, this is my old line. And I'm a little more sensitive to it because I lived in downtown Toronto, right? And the only I lived in uh, uh, Ryerson. And the only downtown uh, uh, convenience store was on Young Street in this basement. This was before the, the, the it was all remade. It was just the Eaton Center at the time. And so you'd walk out there and I'd load this backpack, uh, uh, you know, up with stuff you know, provisions for the week. This is like a big camping backpack. And I hauled that back. And I mean, by the time you got back this 25 minute walk with all your groceries, I mean, you could have, you could have just hosed me down with a fire hose. It's like sweat from top to bottom. It's, it's really incredible. If you start, if you start walking around with 25 extra pounds or 40 extra pounds in your back. And then my, my marquee line is, I'll always say, I have never seen a single human walk down the street with a 24 case of pop under their, under their arm. I've never seen it once. And 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 I think, I, if to me, this is always my thing. If you go to the park, you see people walking around the park, right? So we can tell they like walking around. Like right now, people are just walking around for the, for the sake of just walking around. Well, exactly. But, but if you were, if you, if you had in your head, hey, I'm walking around and I could go to the store, you would do so, I think, right? But the problem is the reason why the person's not doing that is because what you said, they don't want to, they don't want to have a nice casual walk to the grocery, load up 40 pounds of stuff, you know, and collapse in the ditch on the way back, or it's now miserable. It's like, a, it's like a forced march through the Alps or something, right? So I think this is, I think this whole sea change thing is ridiculous. And I, bef before this, and this is, this goes to what you said. Uh, I'm in endless debates with people about the format of things, right? It's like, we want to produce cheap housing and then we want to produce this 30 story building. And then I go, the 30 story building is not a cheap way to produce housing, man. It's concrete, it's rebar. It's an incredibly expensive style of structure, right? And we get into this endless debates, the density versus the whatever. But what I sort of noticed to what you said is um, when this COVID thing came up, I thought to myself, people will instantly go, it's COVID now. Right, we gotta we gotta have a plan of what would happen if, for example, a, a new uh, pathogen would come through, and we decided we just can't use the the public transit at all. Right, and I'm, I'm like I'm like, what's that plan? Because it it strikes me we've seen how insanely vulnerable, and we're not even really vulnerable to it, right? 
But like the density makes you extremely vulnerable to, to have these things spiral out of, out of control, right? And there seems to be no plan at all in any dimension what to do about public transit should it need to be shut down and people still need to get to work, which I think is very real. I don't think I've made up some science fiction thing that just can't happen. What's What are you going to do with elevators? I mean, what are you going to do with elevators? Does one person go up at a time? What's, what's, what's the idea here, right? And to me, if I was a strategic planner, I would go, okay, well, we can, I'm not saying, you know, everybody has to live in a single family detached house, but you do have to have a theory. Well, what are you going to do if only one person can be in the elevator at a time? Like, what are you, what are you going to do? Do you have enough elevators for that? Right? Do you, do you have a backup plan? Do you, do you have, you know, what's going to be the system? What's going to be the system of transit goes away? How is life going to continue? And and what I noticed to what you said is all of the people seem to just be right back onto this urban thing, you know, without like, we're not going to skip a beat. We're, we're going to go right back to that. And then every time Greg puts his hands up and says, what about a pandemic? By the way, a respiratory virus has traditionally rolled out of China one out of every seven years, by the way, if you, if you compute the backstory or to compute like the history of the thing, what will the plan be? And it seems to be, it's like what you said. It's like, it's, there's this vision we're going for the vision and, and there's no interruption to it. You know what I mean? Hi, that's, uh, I live in an apartment building. We're fortunate in that we have two elevators, maybe for 120 apartments in the building with two elevators. And at the moment, they restrict it to two persons per elevator. Um, and it, it, it's not been bad, Greg, to be honest. Uh, I've never had a, a big delay getting in and out. But again, um, you can't make light of it, but there could be worse pandemics. <laughs> you know, more infectious pandemics. This one, um, very much a proximity carried pandemic um, infection. You have to be close to people. Um, so that, um, that that makes elevators susceptible. I don't know what you do. Um, you've got me kind of stumped there. If if another pandemic rolls around and it's worse than this one, should we be going back to single ho fa ho single family homes and the huge urban sprawl? I'm not saying you have to go back to that. I'm saying you saw there's you saw in this pandemic, okay, that there was a cost. There was a huge cost to the density because normally the 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 general idea is there's you know the spreading out of people is hugely costly in terms of land and resources and et cetera et cetera and the urban is compact and cheap, right? Well, it's it's not cheap now. It's you know what I mean because you've had to shut down things with these expansions and we we've had it relative. I mean, even for the scheme of pandemics, this pandemic, Halton has had it as light as light can be. Right. And, you know, we, we went back to the red zone, which doesn't seem like, you know, everything's open. But if you want to go to a 10 person gym, you can. If you want to go out, you know, on the patio with 10 people, you can. And, and, and so we've had these modes of if you can do something, can't do something, can't do something, can't do something. The people in Toronto have been locked down since November. That's when, the, and they've, they've changed the system of restraint, but it's still been locked down to lockdown to lockdown to lockdown, right? And to make it boot, Peel and uh, whatever are going around and closing businesses that have had these outbreaks, right? So at the same time, we're, we're, we're borrowing tremendous amounts of money to spend money to keep everybody in place, right? And so what that says to me is if you're a strategic planner, uh, you have to sit there and go, well, hold on a second. There is an incredible cost now to the, to this density. It's it's not it's not this it's not it, it, there's an additional burden of cost that's born in this pandemic that's created by the density. Is that is that fair? The human race has always been subject to viruses, illnesses, germs, whatever the heck it is, pathogens that that are deadly and. That's been true even when we were sort of tribal people who lived in the uh, who lived in in the wild. Um, I, I don't know how you I don't know how you plan to avoid pandemics. You, you can plan to cope with them, but you, I don't think you can plan to to avoid them. And well, again, uh, 
the, the way you cope with them is by being better prepared to fight them rather than to change the whole structure of society in case the next pandemic looks a bit different or a bit similar to this one. Do you change well, everything? My, my, my point is not necessarily do you change it. I mean, this is what we're doing now, right? Our idea is we just will change everything. We'll change how the number of people interact, what stores can be open. We'll just change everything to comply with a social system which reduces people, you know, interacting with other people, and that'll cut down the, you know, the the spread of the disease, right? But my point is that upon seeing this, I think you sh everything everything should everybody should be forced to figure out what you're going to do in the case of a pandemic in which it requires you to shut these things down. That this time they've sort of they've sort of been quiet about it, right? If you ask them how many COVID infections were created on public transit. It's not highlighted. It's not really broken out for you. There must be some, I assume, right? It can't be zero, obviously, but it's not highlighted. And I think it's highlighted because of what you, not highlighted because of what you said earlier, right? Is that it's, it's like, there's this, I think, I think many, many people, and it goes with the transit, it goes with the density, it goes, it seems to me that there, a lot of thinking is, is, you know, output only. They have this vision. We're going to this vision. And when you start and saying, what about this? What about this? It's like, well, you're getting me off my vision. And my only point would be uh, uh, not to change your whole life, but you you could say, okay, well, if we were in a pandemic, we would have to limit the elevators to two, two people per elevator, right? And that means you can't build a 40-story building with two elevators. Maybe you can build a 10 or 11-story building. You see what I mean? Maybe you can say, okay, well, we're going to have, uh, you know, this number of stairwells and people can go down the stairs and up the elevator, you know? Uh, but I do think when you, when you see the cost that this pandemic, like, because what they've, what we've done in this pandemic is we spent our way out of it by just showering, you know, everybody who can't go to work or every business that has to close for a year now with tremendous amounts of money. <clears throat> but it's very unlikely to work again. Like we're going to be paying for this for years and years and years and years and years. Right. And we're not going to be out of it by the time there's an next one. Like we're still going to be paying for it. And then another one comes along and you're like, you know, how, we, we didn't pay for the first one and the second one. So I'm not suggesting, you know, you know, you never put up an apartment building or you never run a bus route, but I am suggesting there, it seems to me there should be a plan to say, uh, this is how this apartment building could function. You know what I mean? And this is the, this is the same size of it. Cause once the apartment building goes up, we've seen it in Hamilton, a couple places, the whole building just like, you know, uh, goes up top to bottom because um, how do you avoid the uh, how do you avoid the laundry room? How's that working? Um, we do. We have laundry. All of our apartments have their own laundry facilities. Right. Right. Yeah, that's why. So that's the, it's never been a problem in our apartment building. But that's why. That's why. That's exactly why Burlington isn't chock a block with COVID. You all have your own apartment building. The density is pretty low. You've big. You've big apartment sizes. Right. We're not talking about four, we're not talking about floors with 14, you know, 400 square foot apartments like we're building now. Right. You live in a in a in a uh, what I would almost say humane, well-sized uh, uh, rental building. When I lived in an apartment going to Ryerson in downtown Toronto, we lived in a 1500 square foot family apartment. Yeah, 1500 square feet. It was completely, I'm going to say, you know, humane. There's lots of room in it. It wasn't, you didn't feel compressed or crushed down. There was lots of space everywhere. Uh, but that's not what we're doing now, right? Now we're like, this is a 380 square foot thing. And that makes 18 people on the floor. How do they get in and out? Where are they walking? You know what I mean? Because I, I, I think that you have to take, so my only point is you have to have some kind of backup plan. And, and, and the backup plan could be on demand Uber it could be, you know, an acceleration of, of, of some sort of on-demand system or or anything. But I don't think you can just go merrily on and, and not see this this vulnerability, right? As as something that has to be grappled with if it happens again, which is going to happen again. We're not that, that's for sure. We're just talking seven years or seventy years or a hundred. But sooner or later this happens again. I think it's reasonable to have a backup plan and I think it is reasonable to limit the density of things to not create a forest of, you know, 400 
uh, square foot buildings. Like uh, you, you could make rules about independent ventilation in the units. You can make a whole forest of rules. And I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think that's unreasonable. Again, I mean, we're fairly lucky. Uh, you know the buildings that I live in. Um, it's the Drulo buildings along Plains Road in Burlington. Our apartment building is about 12 years old. Independent ventilation, our own laundry room. And for about 120 apartments, there are two elevators, 12 floors high. So the access is very reasonable and very safe, even in a pandemic. Now, maybe... Um, the the codes and the regulations for building permits need to be changed so that every apartment building that's going to be built has this degree of you know, isolatability, I don't have to invent a word. No, I can spend my whole life being isolated because of the, it's a reasonably modern apartment. Um, if I lived in one of the smaller apartments that, that you're talking about, you know, where they're putting them up these 800 square foot um I, I, I don't know how you live in one of them in a pandemic when you can't get out. I, um, I, but again, I, I think that building codes will have to change so that if and when this happens again, um, they're safer. I mean, they're already working on schools to revamp the ventilation systems to make them safer so that when kids eventually go back, they have better air conditioning and heating systems. Do they have to go back and revamp some older apartment buildings? Very probably. Uh, and again, the, the huge cost to that. Who pays for that? <laughs> Does the renter pay for that or the condo owner? Or... Well, I think we're going to discover that there is no money. Like, I, 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 if you look at the expenditures currently with COVID, right, and you just want to take the, – the, the problem is – most of these government entities are just running on on the on on the on the printing press. Where's the four point two billion dollars coming from? It's coming from the printing press, right? You're not taxing the people of Hamilton, which I think would be like seven thousand dollars for so to something like that a person, which is obviously crazy, right? Uh, and so you can't even you can't even make that go over a number of years. I mean, currently I think I I, I saw the breakdown. The average person is paying two hundred dollars towards transit, you know, for their property taxes in Hamilton. If you look at the Hamilton City breakdown, so how many years do you want to go to seven thousand? And and plus, and this is the current Hamilton debate. This thing is not going to be free to operate, right? And and so they keep saying to Hamilton, uh, "Oh, well, you have to pay to operate this thing, which is going to be incredibly politically difficult to dissolve yourself from." Right. And to give you an idea, Hamilton's roughly two and a half, maybe close to three times the size of Burlington. Um, Burlington's operating costs for transit are $10 million a year. So Hamilton's have already got to be somewhere in the range of 25 to $30 million a year. I don't know the exact number, but I'll be up there somewhere. And now they're talking anywhere, depending on whose figures you believe. Um, I think the city's saying oh, it'll only cost us $7 million a year. Whereas originally the province said no, it'll cost you eighteen million dollars a year, so it's a huge ongoing, and that's every year. That's an ongoing expense forever and ever. Plus, as I say, I think the province and the feds are offering three point four. You're saying the total cost is going to be four point two. So there's about a billion dollars in there that the city of Hamilton has to find, and it's probably got to come from taxpayers because this um, cities cannot print money they cannot issue bonds they, they can't go into the money market and borrow it they, they have to raise it by taxes but there's another interesting thing um i don't know if you read in the spectator what three four days ago the construction workers union had a great big piece on how wonderful the lrt is going to be it's going to be awesome for hamilton and I get that because there's going to be a lot of construction workers employed in it. Um, I have never heard either Hamilton Transit, Hamilton Street Railway, or the Hamilton Transit Union workers, I've never heard them come out and say, hey, this LRT is a great idea, get behind it. So my reckoning is that this is a, you know, a, a government development construction project aimed at getting votes and it has almost nothing to do with transit 
Well, th this is this is the secondary problem when you uh, see. Uh, we always get into this transit thing where somebody says we're running. Burlington is the ultimate culprit of this. We're just running buses around that are completely empty all day. So then somebody intelligently puts their hands up and says, well, why can't, how do we make use of this extra capacity? We have these buses running around. There's nobody in them. Can we do free seniors day? Okay. That makes sense. And then somebody says, well, if we have free seniors day on Tuesday, why don't we have free seniors day every day? And then they go, okay, well, that makes sense. And then somebody says, well, shouldn't the veterans get free transit? We go, okay, well, that makes sense. And then we go, you know, you can see where this is going, right? Well, what about students? And they go, okay, well, that makes sense. And then, so the, the problem is, Nobody at the end of it can figure out what 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 is the, what is the what is the purpose of transit? Is it a secondary system to get around? Is it some sort of of uh, I don't want to say charity, but subsidy you know to people who can't have cars? What is it? And I find no one can answer that at the meeting. To your point, um, that was a big part. Um, Burlington provides free transit for seniors every day, Monday to Friday, uh, and as part of that, they also extended it to include low income um, residents, you know, people who are below a certain income level. And then they extended it again to high school students. And again, it makes sense if you have to run a transit system because there are some people who can't afford cars and they have to get to work. So you have to have a transit system of some kind. How you define that transit system, man, is as, as big and broad as you want to make it. So you have to have a transit system. Another advantage of transit systems is the environmental impact. If you can get everybody out of cars and onto buses, you reduce the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases and the carbon footprint. So that's another good reason for having transit. Um, unfortunately, as you say, um, the, the car is such a popular means of transport and such a convenient means of transport in North America and we're all living in cities and towns that were designed for the car. You know, in, in Europe, the cities were designed without cars because the cities are all much older. So that to put public transit in is actually much more attractive. Uh, in North American cities, it's actually difficult to put transit systems in that work because the whole place was designed for cars. And again, the theory is that as you intensify your downtown and build it up, which you say it might be a dangerous thing to do in the future, um, then that level of density allows for, for transit to be more effective and more efficient. But the, the biggest problem is it's, uh, you know, if you build it, will they come question? What comes first? Do you get enough transit users to make it worth your while? building up your transit system or do you build up your transit system and the hope that people will start to use it when it's a lot better the the, the break-even point tends to come um, if you can get people if you get a bus going reasonably close um, every 10 minutes that tends to be the, the cutoff point at that point people will look seriously uh, using your transit system the other thing is that if you can get six people on every bus, then you're ahead of the game as far as the environment goes. You take six cars off the road, and even on a big smelly old diesel bus, uh, there is a, a, an environmental advantage if you can get six people on a bus. When we get to electric and battery buses, hopefully that will be so much better. But uh, the biggest problem, and you, you hinted at it earlier on, is getting people that first and last kilometre you know, I don't know where you live in older shop, but you probably got to walk about what, half a kilometre to a kilometre to get to a bus stop. Uh, I lived actually no, I'm the I'm the uh, I'm the uh, I I live in the West End just down from Plains Road. So like the 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 bus the, the bus is close to me. Um, uh, in terms of the bus, now they they offset the I I don't, I don't like this. They offset the stops from the major roads. So the 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 stops aren't across the major roads anywhere right like they used to they used to they used to parallel them so that the place you got off and the place you got on was the same place and then they shifted them when i questioned them on that they said well this mobilizes the street it gets more people walking around and i'm like yeah but they're walking around on plains road why don't you just put it down the cross street that they're walking down then they'll walk away from plains road you know what i mean and it will be more attractive to use the service because they'll be walking on the street that doesn't have cars on it versus plains road is obviously a busy street you know and 
and I didn't get anywhere with that. But they were like, oh, no, we're and, and this is the difference. The difference is um, you always get in this with bike lanes. Well, you know, if there was if you stood, if you were at us, if you just sat at a sidewalk, right, and, 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 and 20 bicyclists went by in 10 minutes, there would be a bicycle lane there. Like it, it, people would be like, "This is crazy. There's bikes everywhere. We got to get these bikes off the sidewalk," and they would build a, a, a you know, a bike path, right? So I, I don't, I don't think that there is ever any, like, if if somebody just sat there and said in a car, in a bus, in whatever construction, and you saw all these people trying to bike a place, it would be ten minutes at city council to get a bike lane made. It's always there's no one biking, but if we build this bike lane, will they be incentivized to go? And I always think the problematic stat they come up with is they say, well, X people are biking. And I say, biking doing what? Are they doing anything on these bikes? Yeah. Is, they... it, is it fun cycling or commuting cycling? That's, and there's a huge difference. Yeah, there's a huge difference. You see an occasional, I assume, commuter cycler. And then I get into this thing with them. I say, OK, they want it. They're like, hey, we want to support cycling. And so I put my hand up and I say, the we have an ordinance that says when you build an office building, there has to be a shower a public or like a, a, a shower available in the bathroom to the people in the office building. There has to be a change room because almost every day in the summer, you're going to come in sweaty, right? But you, you can't show up at a meeting sweaty, you know, or, or it's shuffled hair or whatever. You have to be presentable in the office environment. So you have to have a place for them to take a shower. Is everybody with me here? And they'll sort of say, and I've said, because without that, this is I think this is a major thing. It drives me nuts. People are expected to show up at work presentable, quote unquote. Right. Uh, you can't show up in your dress shirt and be sweating you know, through your shirt. So so I think this is a major barrier of why people are using their cars is because they th th this is requirement. They show up and I said, well, can we have shower? And they're like, no, no, no. So the, the problem is I find that when I'm trying to I feel I'm always trying to just solve the technical problems with this. Right. Like wh what are the technical problems with really getting someone into their car? OK, well, the technical problems are you have to make the walk nice. You know what I mean? Uh, you have to you have to or shelter them. Right. Uh, this is why, you know, the people said Metrolink says um, uh, I got into a I want to say uh, let's just say energetic argument with the Metrolinks guys at one meeting in which they said um, I said, here's what I want you to do, guys take Aldershot and close it. What do you notice about Europe? All the stations are enclosed, right? You're not getting snowed on. You're not getting rained on. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a sort of a, a big thing along a lot of them. And I'm like, this will solve out the presentable, presentable at work problem. Cause you'll be in a nice air conditioned space and you'll be like, Oh, I just got to walk five minutes up the road to this thing. And they said, well, instead of, and I said, all I want you to do is take the before, and close the station and take the after. Just do the demographics. See how many more people showed up. And they were like, no, no, no. Instead of doing that, we can build, you know, five more Metrolinks concrete platforms in Beamsville or Orangeville or some far flung part of Toronto. And I'm like, okay, that's expanding the reach of the spider. And to your point, now puts a political hotspot of the Go Train station in, in Orangeville or something, right? But I'm not sure that's getting people. I'm not sure that's getting people to take the train myself. Right. And, and when you want to, this is, I wrote an op-ed on this. I couldn't get it published. No one would publish it. But remember how there was all this debate over the Aldershot uh, parking lot, right? Oh, should, because Aldershot, you got all these people who want to take the go train and they can't cause there's no parking. Right. So the cars are all comically parked, pulled up on the street and then the city finds them. And then, okay, are we trying to get people off the road? This is, pre-COVID obviously or aren't we because these people are at least willing to take most of the, the the journey to Toronto on the train right and so the question is do you build a parking lot or not build a parking lot and at that time in 2019 I, I sort of crunched out the numbers and the numbers on the go train are really horrific like if you look at it people people in the fare box are throwing in 500 million I'll just round it off right uh provincial provincial con contributions are 500 million right Non-rare revenue is like 100 million. So operating that sucker in 2019 cost 1.1 billion dollars. Just operating it, not not the capital cost of the tracks and the trains that are all in this other weirdo formula. You know they're also seeding in billions of dollars to build the trains and the tracks, right? This is just operating that sucker. 
And when you compute it out, they'll say, oh, we did 76,000 rides a year. And you're like, okay, well, 76,000 rides seems like a lot of rides. Okay, but they do rides, not trips. Because almost all the rides are symmetrical, obviously, right? Prison's going point A to point B. So when you divide that out, right, it turns out that uh, they're really doing like, you know, 200, they're really only, they're really only implementing 100,000 trips a day at the end of the day. There's 100,000 actual people who are really using that whole system, right? So I, I did the math and it, it turns out that the person who's paying for the ride is paying about 15 bucks per ride. So it's 30 bucks per trip. That, that go train is an expensive system, right? And then if you divide it by customer, depending on how to count it, the amount of money to produce the system, like, like to, like, like I'm using the go train as part of my, my transit solution, right? So how much total is being spent on me? It's between 10, it's between 11 and $15,000 a year is being spent on each user. Partially they're putting in money. I'm not saying they're not and partially the thing. So the, the, the problem is I think more and more systems are going to run into this problem. 15 grand is a lot of money, right? That subsidizes a lot of point to point trips, right? Now to what you said is, you know, that this comes, it comes back to the point of what is the point of transit? Are we just trying to get people out of the way of other motorists? Like, is that what we're doing? We're just like, Hey, we'll make this other system. So there'll be less people on the road. So the other people can drive. Right. You know, or <laughs> you're like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. You're getting people off the road so you can get more people on the road. Yeah. There was a whole rationalization from the downtown. Go look at an old, uh, an old, uh, uh news article on uh down on the uh, subway downtown or, or like the like the the toronto subway right all of the articles are like we need this so you can drive around in toronto that's the point the, the point is we'll build this subway it'll get people off the road so you can still drive around that's there's all these articles selling it like that at least that i, I mean not all of them but the ones that i've seen have this notion in them right so it's obviously being sold like that so the point is this lrt is another because there's been this dream well you can lrt to the go train right but this is at a heck of an expensive jalopy plus 15 g's of the go train network plus the subway at the end you see what i mean it, it starts it's it, it starts being comically expensive yeah but uh, for that whether the government's 3.4 or the total 4.2 billion dollars I'm being a bit facetious here, but you could almost buy everybody in Hamilton their own bus. No, <laughs> can certainly buy them. You buy a bus for every twenty people, for every fifty people in Hamilton. Yeah, well, you can certainly buy them their own car, right? And then, so if you start, well, I mean, if you start saying, if you, the the problem really is, is if you start dividing, if if you start subtracting the money the other way, and you start saying, okay, so we're really getting seven, you know, we're really getting hundred thousand people to work through this system. Right. And you start going, well, what's 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 the problem that these people like? What what is actually the core problem? Is it the people or is it the is it the is the problem the road, e.g. the roads, the roads piling up with people and we need to do something to offset that the road is what we is what we're really sort of focusing on. You see what I mean? And the people are just annoying entities that keep using this road. Or is the problem, you know, Chuck has to get to work. Chuck can't afford to live in Toronto, can't afford to live in Mississauga, can't afford to live in Oakville, can't, and this problem is getting worse and worse and worse, right? But, I mean, if, if everything revamps, we're going to have people, there are going to be people in, uh, you know, Coburg, uh, it's going to be like, it's going to be like a, a five transit system, right? They're going to drive somewhere to take a bus, to take a train, you know, we, nobody knows what's COVID. So, um, I do. I, I don't. I don't think you're a complete Grinch, if you if you sit there and you go, "What is this costing again?" It seems like an awfully inefficient way, you know, to get humans around. If we're talking about four point two billion dollars, especially because this on-demand bus thing is it's not even going to cost. It's 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 not even going to cost close to that because you can see, it costs five hundred bucks a month to lease a car, right? And again, the LRT, if if somebody was saying to me or saying to Hamilton, here's 4.2 billion, here's $3.4 billion from us, you add your $1.2 billion 
and we're going to give you an awesome transit system that will be so good that it will empty all your roads and improve your... Then I would be right on that. But as you say, they're doing this to improve one transit route. The transit route that already exists, it's a pretty busy transit route, to be fair. It runs from, almost from the east end of Hamilton to the west end of it. Um, so it, it serves a lot of people. Um, but again, supposing if it's already a busy route and you put LRT on it, what's the best you can do? Are you going to improve the, the ridership in that by 10 or 15 percent on one route? And meanwhile, all of the transit problems that exist in Hamilton um, will still continue to be. Hamilton just recently started a pilot project. Um, you'll be aware of the bus that runs from Water down to the older shop go station. Um, it's been running for years and it usually runs fairly empty because Water Down's a, 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 a suburb of Hamilton where most people have cars and it's difficult to get into the city of Hamilton from Water Down without a car. And the Water Down bus never even ran from Water Down into downtown Hamilton. It ran from Water Down to Plains Road <laughs> and then people got on a Burlington bus to get into Hamilton. On that route, Hamilton are already looking at changing that to an on-demand system. Burlington are already looking at They've got the, the go-ahead. They've got the money now in Burlington. Um, they're out for tender on the, the software for an on-demand go system. Uh, no, sorry, an on-demand bus system. And another thing they're doing in Burlington, which they may have thought about in Hamilton before they built an LRT, is um, bus-triggered traffic signals. So as a bus comes along Plains Road, it fires a button and the lights change to let the bus go all the way along Plains Road. That does two things. Yeah, it makes transit much faster and much more efficient. But not only that, it keeps the rest of the traffic flowing along Plains Road as well. Because if there's a bus going along there and all the lights are changing in its favour, then it's changing in the favour of all the cars. Plains Road uh, can be a nightmare at times. Well, so this goes back to an old meeting. So I, we actually, uh, um, Tom, you and I actually had a meeting with the powers that be about the fact that the none of the numbers sort of added up by our liking to the number of people and the number of people on the road and the transit deflection. It's just the numbers don't add up. It, it, it has a number of people all of a sudden using active transit or all of a sudden using the you know uh, public transit busing system because that's all there really is on Plains Road right to use. And uh, but when you attack them, we're just like like the the growth rate is crazy. It's like it's like it's like the number of people, and I I we've had worked out it was like you know three thousand people a year just you know not not using their car anymore. And I'm like okay, when you break that down, that's ten people you know today or a number number of people today. But you really think ten people today went we're selling the car and we're just, you know take the planes road bus. I'm like you're you're in lunacy mode. This was the basic conversation. And they had gotten, I think, 40 or 80 Gs from the feds to study this 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 bus system, right? And I said, listen, if you create... Because at this time, how it was sold to me was the cars would be kept at red lights, right? There was a bypass lane to be constructed and all the cars would be sitting there at the intersection because what I said is... What the problem that you get into is if you congest Plains Road with cars because you've built buildings everywhere, right? And they all bring their cars. They congest Plains Road for you. The bus becomes inoperable and your plan doesn't work. It becomes worse because if you're going to sit in traffic for half an hour and you have a choice between a car where you can like play your tunes and you know what I mean? And, and, and be in your own little sort of bubble versus the bus, you're going to choose the car because it's, you know, more time that you don't want to be in that... Yeah, it's a comfort factor, right? And so, and so, uh, what I was saying is that I was I was just dealing this out, and and the 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 I don't I don't know what her status was, but anyway, she was saying, oh well, we're gonna have this thing where we're gonna hold the 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 now congested Plains Road at red lights. There'll be a bypass lane, and the go and the and the bus will you know run around on this bypass lane past past all these stopped cars. And I said. Listen, I've lived in Burlington in my life. I will suggest you politically that system will be in operation for five minutes, like five minutes. Everyone who's caught in this, you know, this thing, when the bus like stops the lane, the bus goes cruising through and they're kind of like, well, now I'm second class citizens on Planes Road. They're just going to go. There's just going to be this this 
pile on of all the city officials and they're going to relent. And it's, I, I just, it's not worth studying. And they sort of said, well, you know, it's public policy. I'm like, yeah, well, the public affects public policy. I hate to break it to you, right? It's only two years since they redid the whole of Plains Road from Maple to Waterloo Road. Did they put in these bus bypass lanes? No. And they now have plans to do from Waterloo Road out to the Botanical Gardens over the next couple of years. I've seen the plans. There's no bypass lanes for buses. So I, there's, I, I, no, there's no I, anything. <laughs> There's none of the, the <laughs> drives me well, nuts because the, the, the one thing there are are great cycling lanes on Plains Road, which, to be honest, it it drives me nuts. Um, my wife and I we walk along Plains Road quite a lot, not com not to commute, but just for exercise. You very rarely see a bicycle on Plains Road because it's a very big busy road and people get a bit afraid to ride their bikes on big busy roads. If you walk down and walk along North Shore Boulevard, North Shore Road, it's absolutely jammed with bicycles. You've got a two-lane road that winds up and down hills and in and out of forests, and you can't move on it for bicycles, and it's extremely dangerous for bicycles because it's so windy and so busy, and there's no place for bicycles to, to go safely. Plains Road, they've got beautiful cycle lanes. They've got on-sidewalk cycling, and you hardly ever see a cyclist. So people are not cycling to get along Plains Road to get into town as quickly as possible. People are cycling for fun, and North Shore Boulevard is a, is a, is a pretty place to cycle. Very dangerous place to cycle because there's no no facilities for cycling. But the vast majority of cyclists want to cycle down there because it's prettier. So I don't know how you overcome that, how you build efficient cycling lanes on your main routes and then nobody uses them because there's prettier routes that they want to use well i this is okay this goes back to an own this goes back to my own i i there's a whole bunch of sort of disconnected east west roads that run through aldershot right that this don't they just don't connect up and i kept i said why don't you guys uh figure out the properties because now we're spending real money right we're spending we're sp this was, you know, we were spending money on trying to create uh, a cycling lane. And I'm like, well, instead of rebuilding Plains Road 15 times with a cycling lane, which is still too dangerous that to me, I would not use um, because the other the other the plot thickens. You also didn't mention that Plains Road is also home of a cement factory and a industrial transport truck. So there's no there's literal cement trucks. It's not a metaphorical cement truck. Right. And they have to turn. They make these big bargy turns. You know what I mean? And there's there's big transport trucks. Ever it's a busy road. There's there's no getting around it. There's no getting around it. And you get some guy cycling down Plains Road, and I'm always like, "What are you doing?" Because the the side is not. It's it's we've sort of we've sort of put this area for the bike to be in, but there's not a meter buffer. So the cars in the right hand lane aren't really allowed to pass that bike. Almost no one knows that rule, but I do. Right. So occasionally somebody passes it, somebody passes it and somebody knows the rule and they stop. And now this whole right lane is like pinned at this bike. The other driver's like, what's going on? <laughs> you know what I mean? And also you have this, what I consider quite dangerous of buses stopped on the road, right? Because we refuse to build them bus gutters. Every time this comes up, I'm like, because you, we're, we're no shortage of money to redo intersections. So I'm like, when we're redoing intersections, could you do like Scarborough and make a gutter for the bus at the intersection so it can pull off, deal with its people, and then re-merge to traffic? And you don't have people jetting out of the right-hand lane, you know, because they don't want to stop behind the bus and, and all this unnecessary drama. But I find that when you bring these things up, you get stopped by the notion, no, don't worry, we can change people. Right. You, you don't have to accept that's dangerous behavior. We'll put in street calming. We'll put in system after system and magically change people's behavior. I'm like, why don't we just go to the path of least resistance? People in Canada with the current density, to me, are not going to put their life on the line to cycle to get to work. Or, or you know what I mean? The, just very few people will do it. So to me, I'm like, if people are on North Shore, can we figure out some way for them to get east to west? You know what I mean? Connect roads. Maybe you got to knock down a couple houses right away. I don't know what you have to do. But it, it seems to be far more straightforward to put a nice scenic tree-filled you know, tree -filled, 
a bike lane uh, across a million roads where there are almost no cars to speak of. You know, I'm then yeah, Plains Road. The, you know, the bus that runs through Aldershot, not the one that runs along Plains Road, the transit bus that runs from very roughly from Fairwood Place right to the to the senior centre. It runs in between Plains Road and Lakeshore for most of the way, and it winds. Why not put bicycle lanes down that same route? You'd be away from Plains Road, you'd be away from North Shore, you'd be away from Lakeshore, and in a bicycle, um, the, the couple of little jogs that you have to make really don't make that big a difference. No, but don't you find? But this is what I find. Just to make it more general, just a general thing. What I find though is you've got, I don't know why this is, you tell me why this is politically or your theory or whatever. Why do you have so many citizens in so many meetings that seem to come up with sort of like, it seems to be a much more common sense approach. You know what I mean? And they, and they just make suggestion after suggestion after suggestion. I don't think any of the suggestions that people make are unreasonable, right? And and it just, it, it seems to hit some blockade and never get implemented by the sort of top-down structure. Um, I think it's because they, they have the power um, <laughs> to implement things and they also believe, rightly or wrongly, that because they are planners and they have a degree in planning or a doctorate in planning or they've spoken to 500 planning consultants that you and I paid for, and this is what the planning consultants say, that they have to be right and everybody else has to be wrong. And again, I think there's there, there's different levels. Um, as you know, I mean, I tend to talk about things for seniors and things for transit. I, I don't want to reinvent the whole of Burlington's transit plans. Um, but I think as a, as a transit user and a senior, uh, if I can tell them where, the, where they need to put a bus shelter so that the seniors don't get sold on a rainy day, they, they should be listening to things like that. You know, so at a big strategic level, yeah, maybe you have to listen to the planners and the consultants, but um, it's very difficult to get Burlington or any city that I've heard of to, to listen to the, you know, what we talk, talk about is the lived experience. I actually live in Burlington. Um, I, I walk in Burlington. I take the bus in Burlington. Here's little things that are wrong, and you can't even get them to listen on that sometimes. No, I, I find that I find that the, the problem becomes that, but here's the thing. It's not it's not quite lived experience. I mean, I mean, you're writing op eds. You're thinking about this. You're with the BFAST crew, right? Like you're 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 not a person who showed up at a meeting. Like I find that Burlington is replete with people who who are who are not stumbling in from the meeting yelling, I don't want this building in my backyard. You know what I'm saying? There's must be 50 characters that come and say, I'm not objecting to redeveloping this lot. I'm objecting to these elements of redeveloping this lot, right? And it seems to me the request chain is completely sane, right? Like, they're just like, 11 stories is high enough. Um, it needs, can it be backed off the street? Could we make sure there's not enough parking so it's not, you know, filling our community with cars when they these people discover they can't park in this building? It seems to be a whole series of really reasonable um, requests. I, I mean, there's, there's very few people that are really coming in there and saying, I don't want anything built in here. I want this <laughs> grassy meadow, you know, for posterity's sake. It seems to me the requests are very reasonable and it improves the livability of the place. And it comes to ground when somebody says, well, that'll mean X less people, right? That, that if you, if we just implement whatever you say, uh, uh, that'll put a cap on the number of people burned to, it'll put a cap on the number of people in the area. And I find almost, the 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 land use planner structure is kind of like we're thinking of land use planning as like a construction of planning land for the use of people but i think almost some of them are all of them who knows they think of land use planning as the construction of moving us towards an urban environment right yeah, yeah. because because that's where the training is another thing to be fair to to the city of burlington or any other city um the person who wants to develop a 40-storey building, you know, on the corner of Plains Road and Waterdown Road, um, is only interested in the money. They really don't care whether Burlington is a better place or a worse place for their building. 
Uh, I don't suppose they care whether you or I as local residents, um, what we think about this particular development. They're looking strictly at the dollars and cents. So they go and they make their plans and they submit them to the city. And, and there's a problem. The city has a very limited time in which to respond to that. You know, it's not as if the city can say, oh, give us time to think about this and we'll, we'll try and improve your developer ideas. The, the, the city gets, I think, what, 120, 90 days, in fact, 90 days to respond to these planning applications. And at any time, the city can have maybe, what, 20, 30, 50 planning applications in front of them, and they all have to be responded to within 90 days. Um, they have a tough time, actually, just checking the boxes, never mind improving the plans. Um, to, to improve the plans that the developers submit, you would need a, a planning staff of hundreds at, at City Hall. So again, I, I think to be, and you'd be surprised just how little say that the city has in being able to alter the developers' plans. It's mostly covered by provincial legislation. That's that's fair enough. Now, the 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 couple developers I've gotten into conversations with, right? Most so first of all, and or I'll, I'll do two points. The first point is. All these applications thrown at once. This is the Rick Goldring. Why do we have? Hope you shout out to Rick Goldring. Hopefully he's enjoying his his uh, his uh, uh, monetary planning career. Um, but uh, his thing was always like, you know, we have an allocation system so that everybody can't put a subdivision application in at once. So if all these people who are still building subdivisions, this this when they all try and put their application at once, the city gets to put them in order and say, oh, we're going to do application one, then application two, then application three. So every application is sitting in a queue for building a new subdivision, waiting for the city to process it. But the apartment buildings are kind of like in under, under the same system of like, I decide I need a new shed, right? So I'm like, hey, city, I need a new shed. And then they say, um, you can't have a new shed. And I go, well, hold on. I'm on the road to LPAT. I'm going to get my shed. <laughs> you see what I mean? There's no queuing there. And his thing was like, we need a queue because we're just getting overwhelmed by these applications, right? And and we can't really respond. And I think that's fair. From the couple of developers I talked to, the the I, the perspective that I sort of got from them, from a lot of the people that are building these mid-range buildings in Burlington, not, not, not the ADI, the ADI guys never really, not these big, they never spoke to me. I have no, no involvement with them. But the smaller developers that used to build townhouses and things, when I was chatting with them, they seem to feel that, you know, they used to build townhouses, they used to build these modest strip mall things, and that was their bag. And their feeling is kind of like, well, that's going away now. I have a, st they have staff, right? Like, not not to, you know, over, uh, um, create a sympathetic develop developer rant, but, but they're like, hey, Sue is the secretary. You know, Fran is in sales. Rick is doing, you know, whatever these people are. I'm responsible for their paycheck. If we don't build anything, all these people go away. Right. And these are the people they've had for 10 or 20 years. So they have they have this weird force to build something that doesn't really connect to their net worth. You know what I mean? Like even if they have two million dollars in the bank and they're like, hey, you know what? I could sit out building for the next 10 years. Right. They can do that personally, but they can't do that and have 20 staff. Right. And all the people that are like looking for the next contract. So they go to this mode where they're like, I have to build something. Right. Once this project's over, we have to have something on the docket. We have to go. We have to go. And what I got the impression from the, the people I talked to is that most of them don't like these high buildings. It's not really their bag. It's high. It's scary. They have to, to build the whole thing. But they feel pressed into service to do this to sort of keep their, their, their development thing growing. And for them, they think the city, it, that, that, that basically the, the, this, the city itself is obstructing them and making them do a whole bunch of things that they, um, they, they're just trying to get whatever can get through this process, right? It's kind of like the benefit to the community has gone out the window because they get in there and they say, Hey, this is what we want. And the city will come back with like, Hey, well, we need $40,000 for an art project. That'll be our, and this, the, no one care. I mean, no one moving the building cares about some art project that's three quarters away in 20 years, right? Like, I mean, there's like, whatever. So like, sure, throw the, the $40,000. Whereas I put my hand up and I say, no, I want the base units commercially vented, right? Which by the way, Niagara has, so someone figured it out. This is not, you know, an unreasonable ask. Now you got me ranting. But um, 
but they just try to jump through the hoops to get this freaking thing <laughs> through this process, right? No, they, there's the, the idea of 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 how is lost to them, and then if you get into the conversation about how about X, Y, or Z, I noted this uh, when I was talking to the developer that was redoing the building over Kelly's Bake Shop, right? So I was telling him, I said, uh, you know, you're getting all this stuff about disrupting Kelly's Bake Shop, right? This is this was in the initial, the first plan of it. I'm like, why don't you get together with some designers, you know what I mean, and build a three-storied brick facaded, you know what I mean? Uh, just, just brick the first couple stories, make this like whole corner thing, you know what I mean? And, and, and build this, like, you could put a fireplace, you could just build this thing, right? And say, well, we're, we're, we're tearing down this building, right? But we're going to put this brand new space and show pictures of it at the meeting. We're going to build this thing. We're on board with, you know, we've got this whole thing set up. And, and you'll overcome all this resistance, right? And the developer said to me, um, he said, th like, so first he thought I was going to be combative, right? And then he realized that I was not, you know what I mean? He's like, okay, okay, we're now just in a conversation about what to do. You're not, you know, it took, you have to get a rapport going a little bit, right? Because he's in this meeting and people are calling him the worst person ever and he's defensive, right? He's, no, he's defensive. He's, he's like, he's like, you, you're telling him that you're building a crap building. In his mind, he knows what a crappy building he could build, right? But in his mind, he's like, he's putting a nice facade, he's putting nice windows in. Like, he, he's got a spreadsheet in which he could take a million bucks out of this building, you know, put a complete piece of garbage up that he thinks he's spending, right? So anyway, to, to the, the point of the story is that guy said to me, he goes, look, we're going to have this commercial space glassed off and anybody can come in there and do whatever you want. And I had, and I, and I, I said, okay, I appreciate that. And then later I was thinking about, and I had an aha moment. I think this is one of the big tensions around development. The guy is a developer, Okay. And he has staff. He's got architects. He's got, he can make anything happen. Agreed. He can say he's got artistic people. They can draw him drawings. So when this guy walks around the universe, he doesn't really care what's there. He just cares what could be because he can make all these things happen. Right. Um, and, and when you have somebody like who did Kelly's bake shop and, and Ke Kelly can sort of, I don't know her capabilities or not, but, but she's, she's running a bakery in a space that already exists, you know, uh, out of a building that's standing there. You see what I'm saying? So I think one of the problems we have is that the developers can come in and they're assuming that there's this second wave of per, a person that shows up that can sort of like reimagine all these spaces in a way that makes sense to them. You know, see what I'm saying? So to the developer's mind, when they're building this building, you're like, well, you're tearing up these historical things. In their mind, they're like, well, don't worry. Some other version of me will come in. You know, it's, it's like me, but I do a cupcake store. Me, but I run a record store. They're, they're assuming that everybody in the world has this capacity to walk into this glass enclosed space and say, let's put feeling and, you know what I mean, an old time. Am I explaining that right or am I, am I babbling? Um, well, along the same, similar vein, um, you're familiar with, uh, the, what do you call it, the downtown... Village in Burlington, you know the little walkable area that's got cute restaurants and cute little. Familiar with it? We used to go get our Christmas ornaments every year from a little store in there. Yeah, but but people say that is old traditional Burlington. It's not. That was built in the nineteen seventies. You know, it's not ancient Burlington. It, it's newer than Brent Street. <laughs> you know, Brent Street's really old. Um, but that, that, that was a development in the 1970s to, to look like a cute downtown rather than a, an original downtown. So I was talking to planners when they when they ditched the official plan and started the second official plan. Um, they asked me to come in and talk to them um, to see if there was anything. You know, they should be avoiding. They're not letting me plan it, but they're saying, Tim, tell us some of the things we should avoid. And I said a very similar thing. I said, um, if you could put a 20 story building on the corner of Brent Street and James, what's you going to do? And the first floor of it looked like Kelly's Bake Shop or looked like the, you know, the, the little village, the walkable village. People would love you for it. It's not the 20 stories that bugs them. It's the, it's the, it's the destroying what they know at the street level that's bugging them. So that if you write into your official plan that you can build whatever the hell you like, 
but make it look like the, the downtown Burlington that people loved. And, and you can do that because, as I say, that the, the downtown village is a fairly modern construction. It's not a, an 18th century or 19th century village. It's very much a 20th and late 20th century building. But it looks exactly what everybody would like downtown to look like. So why can they not do that? Build a 20-story tower, but have the, the facade of Kelly's Bake Shop and Luigi's Pizza and whatever at the ground level where people are walking. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't walk around looking up to see how tall the building is. And, and I tend to walk around looking at where am I going next? And I'm going to Kelly's Bake Shop or Luigi's Pizza. Yeah, no, no, I... I... This is so. This is you know the the towers that you were talking about just in a, where where you're living now, right? I looked at it. I'm like, ah, you know what? The buildings are reasonable. They're backed off of the street. They're not really imposing. I complained about the quality of commercial and that I wanted commercial under all of them, right? But they went, ah, oh, well, we can't do that. Blah blah. blah. Well, whatever. I, there's so many irons in the fire. There was no big complaint. Like there wasn't like a big uprising against that development, right? The, the, the people's complaint was they're losing the strip mall, right? That we're, we're losing the strip mall. And then the, and that's their complaint. There used to be Canadian Tire and all these things there, which just disappear and never come back, right? Um, but no one's complaint in that setting was the 11 or 12 story building height, right? It's not right in the street. It's backed up. And I, I'm with you. I don't know why someone doesn't draw like you could just draw what it would look like at the street level, put this big brick facade on it, make a breaker and then put your steel and chrome and whatever, just back it up. It doesn't even have to be a huge number of feet because it just, just provide a visual breaker. Right. Because the thing that I always say, like, don't get me wrong. If you apples to apples produce a place where people walk around, you do discover it's two to three stories. I mean, you do discover that like lots of places I look around. I've noted Disney world's a perfect example of this. Right, like if you walk around Disney World or an amusement park, they are really sensitive to the building height. They know that two to three stories is it, and they just cap it, and that's as high as everything is. But that's because they're providing big, wide boulevards with this big open sky, right? But, but, it, it, but my point, you know, another example. Your point is, and my point is that this old timey feel, this place you want to walk around, is a hundred percent contrived. It's just a contrived space where your, your your thing is working out. Another one, if you're ever if we're ever allowed to go to Florida again, we'll see. Um, if you walk around Disney Springs, right, you really have to walk around there and appreciate this is a completely contrived pedestrian space out of whole cloth. And it uses, it has big wide streets. You know what I mean? And what's so bizarre about this is people are traveling you know, they're traveling to Florida as a destination, then driving to Disney Springs, then taking a, a really uncomfortable walk over these big, because uh, the parking's way away, right? So these big walkways to walk around here for two hours. So I go, well, why don't we just copy these things slavishly? You know, because you know, these things are the type of things that empire people to walk around. And it almost seems like, it almost seems to me, if I want to be cynical about the whole thing, it's like, well, you've missed the point. The point is to make communities that look like Blade Runner, right? And if you're like, well, hold on, you don't need to 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 cajole people. We know they'll walk around a park, right? Like, yes. We can see all the places in North America people are walking around by themselves. They're like, yes, right? I'm like, why don't we just copy that? Like, don't even think. Think downtown Burlington, a theme park based on the old downtown Burlington. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And that's all you have to do. And that's going to be easy to do today. I mean, it's not an engineering miracle that it takes to, to do that, to, to build a very high structure with the bottom of it looking pretty or looking any way you like. But it's it's is it not as simple as the style guide to say the last three stories have to have brick on them? Yeah. Well, this is the traditional... This is, this is my irritation with Aldershot. When they're doing the style guide for Aldershot, I had this... I actually had... There's like six different zones... And I was like, okay, so each will thematically we'll, we'll put a theme on each zone was my idea, right? So the style guide would change as you went to zone to zone. And then because Aldershot had this history of brick, right? And it's got like a distinctive brick too. There's like a distinctive Aldershot red brick color that comes. I'm like, why don't we just pick brick for Aldershot and say the top, the bottom three stories of the buildings have to have brick on them. Red Aldershot brick. They do this 
everywhere in the States to great effect. You go on these university campuses and all the buildings have brick on the bottom and you just walk around and you're transported back. You don't even notice. I'm with you 100%. It's, I don't know why we can't get that done. There seems to be... There's, in the American universities, they probably even put up fake ivy. Just to make it look. They don't need fake ivy. That ivy grows by itself. It's fertilized by the minds of the children that are that are attending the attending the uh, university. So basically, I think the summary point of where, where what you're coming from is: why are we building? Why are we building a fixed technology that has no no movability in the future? No movability, no movability. We can't adjust to any trends with it, right? It costs a ton of money. Well, you know, why Why are we doing that is the basic summary. Especially when every piece of technology that, that we now use is becoming more and more flexible and less and less rigid. Everything we do is, is heading towards flexibility, changeability, adaptability. And here we are saying we're going to spend an absolute fortune um, to put something in that's very fixed, very rigid, and I, I, I suggest that we'll look aged very, very quickly, especially when there are so many better alternatives out there. I'm not suggesting don't spend the money. Um, if the federal and provincial government want to give us $3.4 million, let's go, let's take it. But, but let's use it to get um, better transit for Waterdown, better transit for Ancaster, to get them into the city, um, better um, bicycle reins along Plains Road, <laughs> or whatever. There, there's so many more things that could be done with it that would improve people's ability to get around instead of improving the, the, the travel time for a very limited number of people. They've already got a pretty good, it's the, the B route, I think they call it, along, along Main, Main Street in Hamilton. They've really got a pretty good transit service along there. It would be so easy to improve it without spending $3.4 billion. Well, especially since Hamilton has a $1 billion infrastructure gap on the books right now. So last I checked, there's $900 million of, this is like the guy goes out, he looks at it, this bridge needs fixed, right? Ideally, this repair should be done. He puts it in the, he puts his look, this bridge needs this repair work puts it in the in the kitty right and it's just sitting there last time i checked there's 900 million dollars of projects in that hey we could spend this thing and it's not fair to burden hamilton with its weird mountain thing either right there's a lot of hugely expensive roads that go up and down the mountain right all that needs paid for the idea that the that the you know that dollar to dollar is is expensive running hamilton is running burlington is ridiculous because you have this 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 mountain issue with you know uh, uh these multi hundred million dollar projects or 10 million dollar projects that need to service these roads and all these cuts that go up and down and et cetera, et cetera. so i'm with you i'm more i'm more when you're putting this lrt in not only are you spending all this money to me there's a huge number of scenarios in which you could just get pulled out again in 10 years like you could have what are the things you could have you could have everybody deciding that the on-demand city subsidized route is the way that they want to get around right that'll kill it off you could have population version nobody wants to live in hamilton because of just permanent covid things right you could just have people that don't want to live there and, and, and you could have covid or another uh respiratory event just killing off the transit system altogether and you could have a whole series of budgetary realities that prevent it from being subsidized at all so and the whole thing is also loosely based on the fact that people need to go places where you might find with telecommuting, nobody cares no, to go anywhere. It's any longer, yeah. That's right. There's not the same need to, to get along that, that, that Hamilton B-line route because people are telecommuting. But again, you know, you talk about um, infrastructure deficit in Hamilton. Um, that, that seems to be a big part of the, the selling. While we're building the LRT, we're going to improve a whole load of the, the infrastructure along the route. Uh, that's fair enough. That will probably happen. But then they, they come up with a, the lie that when they improve that infrastructure as part of this two $3.4 billion, when developers then want to come and build along that new successful LRT route, they will pay the city development charges and will get the money back. 
Um, all the evidence in the world from Toronto to Hamilton to Burlington is that development charges do not recover the cost of infrastructure. And in recent years, the, the provincial government, the Ford government, has reduced the amount of development charges that developers have to pay. So the, the pretense that this money will come back in development charges, nah, some of it will come back, but no, it won't recoup itself at all. Uh, no, that's true. And, and, and knowing a couple of people that are on the development charges uh, count, uh, or, you know, citizens group from Burlington, if you look, start looking through the rules of how the development charges work, it is extremely restrained on what you can throw into the development charges basket. It is designed if you want to make it, if you want to, if you want to give it the most favorable, I don't know, look at it, right? It's designed from the ground up so that you don't pile on the developer and it's also sort of it's also sort of set up so that like the developer is not really can't be held responsible for for traffic problems that are created by this increased development. Right. That's all on you. That's all just on the average taxpayer. You can't sort of come in there and sort of start going, well, you're create you, know, you can get a couple intersections modified at most. Right. But all the downstream problems are coming to you. You can't go back to the developer and say, well, this is all the work we need to do on the floodplain. You can get them to do a couple of things on their property. Right. But the flood still, you know, comes through the street once the 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 impermeability of uh, the impermeability of the ground is there. And then uh, so there's a whole bunch of other things. Like if you start sitting there and my spreadsheet's even kind of right. And I'm saying, well, hold on. The go train alone is costing 15. That we're set. You know, that's the cost of this thing. Fifteen thousand bucks. Right. If you start a construction where, you know, I'll you're, I'm a company. People working at home are not as good as people working in my office. Right. There's a loss of productivity. They get distracted, whatever. But is it ten thousand dollars? Yeah, because because if it's put on you, it strikes me that if it's, it strikes me that if you made everybody pay, the real value of all these things, right? Like if you if you took away the subsidy system, they would immediately just take their hands off the 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 pie, you know what I mean? Invent all these things. So if if I was going to spend if you if you gave me three billion dollars to spend in Hamilton, so first of all, they need a billion dollars. They need a check for a billion dollars. The 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 feds in Ontario don't like to do it because, you know, if you bail out Hamilton, then all the other municipalities come a cropper. You know why? Why can't we pay for this and that? But the reality is, there's not enough people there to pay for these structures. Right, you're billion dollars in the hole right now, right? And so, uh, uh, all that stuff needs to get paid for. Write them a check for that. And I would just do a distributed, you know, and, and, and it doesn't even actually have to be run by the city. You could pilot it out on Uber, you know, you could kind of deal with them, see how well it works and then go from there. Right. Um, in terms of whatever. And if you took that money and you cut off two to three dollars of each Uber trip, I think you'd find the two dollar in fare box. You'd, you'd, you'd be you'd be pretty close to, to changing the gap. But but I think that our basic point here. The basic summary, and I'm going to agree with you, the basic thrust of your whole thing is the real problem with the LRT is extreme expense at low flexibility. Right? That's your basic complaint. Yeah, in a world where everything else is different. Like, the, 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 I, I, this is a good point that you've made. Okay, the point is, where else in the world do you see that trend? Do you, do you see, because the phone is getting more flexible and cheaper, agreed? Right. Everything is getting more flexible and cheaper. And this is going back to less flexible and more expensive. So I think that's a good point. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, people listening that, that came across. So what's what's next? What's next, Jim? What's next? I don't know. Um, as I say, I'm quite happily retired. Everybody complains about being locked down. Um, you know, before we were on the air, I said to you, I retired 10 years ago so that I could stay home and do nothing. And now the government is ordering me to do that, so I'm quite happy. What's next? Um, I'll probably, I probably like to be involved. It's almost like a hobby, whether it's with transit issues, seniors issues, planning issues. I even get involved with the local partnering Aldershot group, um, which you're probably reasonably familiar with. I'm not sure how much they love me because I tend to be a new Aldershot instead of an old Aldershot person. But again, I, I just like to stay involved and hopefully stay involved in a way that you know, that improves things for the community, improves things for people in general. I got to do something, Greg, uh, or I'll go crazy, right? 
Are you announcing your uh, candidacy for the upcoming election right now, or are you going to hold off on that? I was going to ask you if you were announcing. <laughs> I'm not announcing. I'm not announcing anything. Um, uh, I, I I can tell you for sure that I would be the least the least popular. To, I was I was talking to someone and I was like, "Wow, is that not a saving grace to lose that election before COVID?" I mean, it's just a blood, it's just a bloodbath, terrible four years to be a counselor with this COVID stuff, right? I mean, everything's a snip over the masks or a, or a, a, a it's a, it was a nightmare job for sure. Uh, normally it's not, I mean, it's, we'll say a reasonable job, but, but I can't imagine the, it, the nightmare. And then they're going to, oh, I'm just telling you, you're going to go through the numbers and the cities are going to be like, we don't have any money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they're going to be like, well, we want a 5% tax increase. And then you're start going to go, well, all these seniors, they don't have any money to pay this. And again, you know, if you look at the money they're going to spend on SLRT for something that, even if it works, it's 10 years away, if it works, and I doubt it'll work. We've got so many other problems thrown at us by COVID, so many other expenditures, so many things that have been dragged backwards that we need to fix rather than looking forward. Um, there's a lot of money that can be spent getting back to normal instead of trying to plan for a, a bad idea 10 years down the road. Well, I, I mean, I just think it's all going to come. People sort of have this idea they've got the solution. This money's coming from everywhere. I don't think it's going to happen like that at all, right? Like when you are when you have people who argue lockdown, the other people sort of start going, well, hold on a second. There's a huge back-end cost of lockdown, right? Like there's all this stuff that's going to need to get paid for, right? And and right now we seem to be in this in this mode where we're like, hey, we're getting past this thing. You know what I mean? And the hangover the next days for tomorrow. Right. We're just, you know, in the pub at 3 a.m. still drinking. Right. But but this will go away at some scale. It has to go away or, or become a, a background problem. One or the other. The minute that happens, all this cash is going to come immediately how is this going to get paid for? How is this going to be paid for? There's going to be no way to run away from it anymore, right? Because we'll be out of the pandemic. And so all of these cities are going to go, well, hold on, our revenue. Nobody rented any of these things for a year because we told them they couldn't. Where is that money coming from, right? And it's going to be thing after thing after thing after thing of money. And they're going to go back to this transit, the, all these different systems. I, I mean, I almost think in Burlington, it'll just shatter out because of that. It it, it 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 will and someone will come up and say, well, why don't we subsidize Uber for two bucks in the city of Burlington and see if that works? Mm. That shreds a lot of costs and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And again, a lot of you know when you look at the the, tra the tax structures for cities, um, businesses pay more than residential taxes. So that if, if a huge number of businesses have been hit hard by COVID, been bankrupted, been put out of business, or been reduced to the stage where they can't afford their taxes. Um, how, do, how do you make that up? Yeah, it's, not, it's not hard. And and this this also implies you don't get a commercial property ca uh, crash, right? And uh, the other problem that you've got is the commercial space that's left in Burlington that, you know, these little strip malls that we all drive up to, the cost of those strip mall things is insane. It's like f five or 10 Gs a month, right? And a pad site is even crazier. Like, you know, when you sort of see the keg and all these these places, right? Those guys could be playing 20, 30 Gs a month in rent on this pad site. So you close them for a year. Restaurants have been closed for a year, right? Now, where's the 300 Gs coming from? Just to pay rent. Forget the staff. You know what I mean? And all the rest of the insurances and the whatever. I'm just, just, I'm just trying to get this, this building paid for, right? All of this stuff, if you, you know, one of two things could happen. Everybody could come out of COVID and decide they're going to spend money like drunken banshees, right? And you could have the roaring 20s, which is this huge surge of sort of inefficient expenditures followed by a, like a massive depression, right? Or you could have the depression right on the, right on the, on the get-go. But in any scenario, someone is going to have to figure out how to uh, uh, make up the budget in all of these cities, right? It's going to require trimming of the city. No one's going to like this. But the numbers will just fence you in. We can't afford all this stuff anymore. That, that's just what will happen. Because you won't be able to go to the, the property owners of Burlington like this, you know, or hall or whatever the region is, and tell them that, you know, you, you can only suffer so much increase 
you know what I mean? You can only increase the 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 property taxes by such a percent before the the people revolt and they go, well, I don't care about parks then. I don't care about transit then. I don't care about street sweeping then. Don't pick the leaves up. If it means I'm paying three hundred dollars more a year, I don't care about any of that stuff. All of the sudden. So, so the, the politicians are boxed in and they're going to get in this, if you ask me, and I'm no expert, but they're going to get in this cycle of retraction. We're all not going to like it. And, and again, the, there's an assumption that uh, when, when COVID ends, there's going to be this huge explosion of pent-up demand. Um, I, I think there'll still be a lot of very cautious people when this ends. People who get used to staying at home. People who look at it and say, hey, I used to spend 70 bucks, 80 bucks every week going for... Know, for dinner once a week and a couple of beers once a week. I'm not spending that any longer and I'm quite happy. <laughs> I drink at home, um, my bank account's looking rosier. Um, so I'm not sure that, that there will be that huge burst of pent-up demand or if there is, it won't be as big as some people suspect. So I think what will happen is, if you just this is a general notion, the keg will be fine. Like in, There's always people in the keg Wednesday with 12 people. I'm like, how rich are these people? Like there's like kids looking at iPads. I was like, I would never let them. You know what I mean? This is supposed to be a thing. Obviously, they just have money in their. The, you know what I mean? The 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 keg is fine. It will be fine. Uh, like Lord Nelson, they'll keep trucking. I don't think there's a, a, a. I have no fear from them, because all of those people that go back, if the bill's two fifty or three, what is it? Okay, sure, three hundred. They're at the door. Where I think it really does matter is kind of like the pub, right? What are you going to pay for a beer at the pub? You know what I mean? There's a real, I think there's a real, I think what you say is 100%. A lot of people are going to come to the pub and they're like, a beer is $20. You know what? I can, I can, uh, I can drink beer on the balcony. You know what I mean? Hey, Frank, come, we'll sit on the balcony. We'll sit in the backyard in a couple chairs. We can drink beer out there. You know, it, I, there's a real threshold, I think, via which people go, no, that experience is not necessary. Uh, to me, I'll, I'll, I'll go wherever. So, It'll be exciting times. We'll have to see how it all works out. Yep. But thanks. Uh, thanks very much for your time, Jim.